Well, we've just talked about the idea that light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation sometimes behave as particles and the photoelectric effect cannot be described any other way except by thinking of light as a particle. And you might say, well, is light a wave or a particle? And I say, that's a really good question because it depends. Certain applications, um, it, it acts like a wave. And other applications, it acts like a particle. Well, which one is it? Well, it's kind of both. That's why they call it the wave-particle duality. Well, in this section, we're going to ask the question, if waves can act like particles, can particles act like waves? And the short answer is yes. In 1923, uh, de Broglie suggested that since light waves exhibit particle-like behavior, particles of matter, like electrons, protons, whatever, should exhibit wave-like behavior. And the wave length of a particle that's moving, so we're talking about a particle of mass m that's moving with momentum p, which for non-relativistic particle would be m times v, the, the momentum of that particle, that the wavelength that that particle uh, has as it moves is given by h over p. You might say, well, hang on, that looks a little bit similar to the momentum of the electron. Remember, I'm sorry, the momentum of light. Remember that in a couple of concepts ago that the momentum of light of wavelength lambda was given by h divided by lambda. Well, if you just reverse this, multiply both sides by lambda, divide both sides by p, then you get this relationship, exactly the same relationship that we had before between the momentum of light and its wavelength. But now it's turned on its head. It's saying, now we're talking about a particle, a particle uh, of momentum P, the relativistic momentum, and actually we'll need, uh, Uh, that's the full, as we talked about in special relativity, the full description of the relativistic momentum of the particle. Well, what's the, what's the proof, he might be saying? And the answer is to do this experiment. Remember the Young's slit, double slit experiment. We took light, we shone it on two slits, and then we looked to see what the pattern would be on, the, on a far screen. At first, we might have guessed that the, the pattern form would have been just a, the image or the shadow of the double slit, so that that light comes through this slit and concentrates on this left spot on the screen, comes through the right slit and concentrates on the right spot uh, on the screen. But then we showed that um, by looking at the path length differences that we wouldn't get this. We would instead get a uh, a fringe pattern with bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, the, the familiar interference pattern. Well, now we're talking about electrons. So we've got a beam of electrons. We shine it on these two slits. Wouldn't we expect just these, the image with two, two spots on it? The expected behavior would be that the electrons produce images of these two slits. What's the actual behavior? It's that the electrons produce an interference pattern of bright and dark fringes like that produced by light. So we got a bright spot in the middle. Remember, so we're, if we look at the very middle central point, right smack dab between those two slits, we get a bright spot, not a dark spot like you'd expect. Um, and then you get another bright spot here and here and then, and then further out, bright, dark, bright, dark fringes. And so the upshot is that in this experiment, these um, 
particles, electrons, exhibit wave-like characteristics. It's called the wave-particle duality. Here's the evidence. Um, and this was done by uh, Davison and Germer did this experiment. And uh, it's since, since been replicated very carefully by others. So you've got these two slits. You've got electrons coming out toward the slit. You get a central uh, a bright fringe, then um, uh, bright, bright, dark, bright, dark, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens is that you can't start to see the pattern until after you've got a lot of electrons. So with only 100 electrons, that's this, this case here, it's hard to see much of a pattern there. This is what you see after 3,000 electrons. You, you start to see a central, a bright spot here, bright spot here, bright spot here. And this, this is after 70,000, and you've definitely got this wave-like behavior, this interference pattern. Uh, a bright spot, a bright fringe, bright fringe, dark in between. So bright, 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 and then dark in between those bright fringes. So you might say, well, this is kind of weird because um, where's the electron? Which slit is it going through? And I say, I'm sorry to say, but there's no way to tell. The electron's behaving like a wave. And so you cannot say whether it goes through the right slit or the left slit. Those electrons as they're coming through are behaving like particles. Now these are actual, each dot on here is, is actually the, the, uh, the image of an electron hitting, but things get murky when they're passing through those two slits. So a beam of electrons is directed at two narrow slits, and the resulting pattern is observed on a screen that produces a flash whenever an electron strikes it. What's the most surprising observation that, that is made in, uh, in this experiment? The electrons do not all strike the screen at the same location. Well, that's not too surprising. Uh, the electrons produce flashes on the screen. That's not surprising either. Uh, the pattern on the screen is an interference pattern. Yeah, that's why it would be an interference pattern. The shadow of two slits is observed on the screen. That's not true. It's not just the shadow of those two slits on there. It's a true interference pattern with bright, dark, bright, dark. The electrons produce the same pattern on the screen with or without the slits in place. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, example five, the de Broglie wavelength of an electron and a baseball. So here's that same de Broglie wavelength. And we're interested in knowing what that is for an electron traveling at a high speed and for baseball. Well, um, here's for the electron. Electron moving six times 10 to the six meters per second. So actually at six times 10 to the six meters per second, P equals M V, because this relativistic correction is small. We're talking about 10 to the 6 meter per second here for V. C is 10 to the 8. So when you square that, this correction becomes small, and you get the square root of 1, which is 1. So it's approximately equal just to the classical um, momentum. So here's M, the mass of the electron. Here's the speed of the electron V. Here's Planck's constant, and we end up with um, an electron wavelength of about 1 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Now, what about for baseball? Well, uh, we're told the mass and the speed of the baseball, so we plug those in to find the momentum, and we get a wavelength that's 10 to the minus 34 meters. Well, um, that's a really small, 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 small wavelength. And that, because that is so small, the, these kinds of behaviors aren't seen with real objects that we generally deal with in our everyday lives, like the size of baseballs or our bodies or a pen. Or, um, but with this kind of a wavelength, 
1.2 times 10 to the minus 10, that's a wavelength that is um, smaller than the wavelength of light. And the wavelength of the electron is large enough for diffraction effects to actually be observed, as we'll talk about, well, as we, sh as we showed in the previous slides. But the wavelength of the baseball is too small for that. So for objects in our macroscopic world, we don't see these waves of probability. So if, if you think about this electron, uh, the, the electron through two slit experiment, you have to think about those electrons being um, probabilistically, not where they actually are and which slit they pass through. You have to think about them as, as a group, like, like light, like a wave. And, um, and you have to think about, that. this is the only way to make any sense out of that double slit experiment with, with electrons. Uh, any practical applications of this? Well, yeah. Um, electron microscopes. Because that wavelength of about 10 to the minus 10 meters is smaller than the wavelength of light, the, you can resolve pictures to much higher resolution using electrons to visualize rather than light. That's the principle of an electron microscope. Um, the microscope used for this photograph takes advantage of the electron wavelength, which just can be made much smaller than that of visible light and give, gives exceptional resolution. So you using those electrons as waves to visualize actual objects. You know, Einstein didn't, he, he wasn't comfortable with the whole idea of waves of probability. He wasn't comfortable with quantum mechanics at all, which is the study of these, these quantized energies and that sort of thing. He never really got very comfortable with it. Um, but hundreds of experiments since then have shown that this probabilistic view of nature is actually correct. And uh, um, one of the most amazing uh, predictions of quantum mechanics is where quantum mechanics and electromagnetism are united in a theory called quantum electrodynamics. Uh, quantum electrodynamics, QED. And uh, that predicts um, the the spin of the electron, a coefficient for the spin of the electron to uh, one part in 10 significant figures. To, to 10 significant figures, you've got theory and experiment that agree with each other. So it's a theory that will not go away <laughs> because it really works, but it's very strange and difficult to get your mind around. 